That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., creator of theblackvault.com, and this will be probably one of the last times I preface these either video presentations or audio stream, if you're listening to that, with this. Now, some of you or most of you should know by now, I'm converting a lot of the video presentations that I do into audio podcast versions. I got a ton of requests for it. I thought, since I was using visuals, some of you may not like that. Uh, quite the opposite, it's been a fairly big hit and people prefer it. So although I'm still going to continue doing the YouTube videos, if you are listening to the stream and you're hearing me point something out, just know that's why. There's a video companion. It's the exact same thing that you're listening to, but rather with visuals. If you want to check that out, it's www.theblackvault.com slash live and you can uh, view not only this video but quite a few others if you are watching live on youtube welcome or if you're watching the stream welcome to you all it's always a pleasure to have you show up for these because a lot of times my insecurity takes over and goes john nobody's going to want to hear you blab about anything but i've received a lot of requests for doing a video on this particular topic. Now, what is that? Well, for those of you who pay attention to social media, something has kind of erupted here in the last couple of days, and that is an appearance of an article from a U.S. Army counterintelligence agent that has told a story. Uh, his story, which I'll get into, essentially ties into Luis Elizondo to the Stars Academy, Tom DeLong, and the History Channel show Unidentified. He had quite a story to tell, and what's interesting, uh, at least on my end anyway, is that I learned about this in 2019, and I have kept my mouth absolutely shut about it simply because of a conviction that you guys know I hold, and that is running a story of solely anonymously sourced information. And I don't do that. And so for the last two and a half years, I have essentially waited for the story to become public before I were to talk about it. I did not want to quote unquote break the story. Uh, if this particular person, the CIA agent wanted to be named, then I would have absolutely been happy to do that. Uh, even to this day, they still do not want to be named. Uh, they want to remain anonymous. And I want to deal with that first uh, before we get into the story, because a lot of you know me as someone who speaks out considerably hard about stories that are anonymously sourced. If an anonymous source is used to back up information, I got no problem with that as long as the, the information is verifiable. But in the last couple of years, we have seen this I would say incredible increase of UFO related stories that are solely sourced to no one, that they're just anonymous and we can't back them up. We get no title. We sometimes hear they're a DOD senior executive official, whatever the, the, the buzzwords are, but really no identifying information and the information is not verifiable other than the journalist or the blogger who brings it forward. Well, that has become an epidemic in itself, where that is just rampant throughout this conversation. So how is this different? Because this particular person wants to remain anonymous, and here I am bringing the story to you, and it may seem somebody called me a hypocrite on Twitter uh, for, for doing that, and I wanted to quickly explain how I felt it was different. Now, I'm not running a story on this telling all of you to just trust me. Uh, rather, now that the story has been posted publicly, and again, we'll get into that, now anybody can grab that information and start vetting it, dissecting it in whatever way they want or can. And I'll go through how I did it, so that way you guys see what I did in 2019. Uh, but also, it's available to all of you. So in essence, even though the person is kind of still shrouded in mystery, I don't know if this is a 100% definite, but maybe that person's identity will be revealed in the future. Until then, they're anonymous. And with that, uh, I, I think that even though there's still apprehension on my part, I can tell you that they were never anonymous, not only to me, but now that they have posted their, their 
uh, information publicly. Other people contacted them and vice versa. And this particular person actually wanted to be vetted by others as well. So you don't have to take my word for it. There are now others, including a moderator on the popular social media network Reddit, who is a law enforcement officer, a moderator, has been around for a while. Um, I don't know them. And in fact, I didn't know them until today. I reached out to them. I have a statement from them as well. Uh, but again, former law enforcement officer and this particular person who has this story was vetted by numerous people at this point and not a single person has come out and said you know what nope this guy doesn't check out uh on the opposite the credentials all check out across the board so this was the post uh that kind of created all of the hoopla the uh subreddit was aliens uh but it got forwarded to quite a few other uh sub what are called subreddits as well if you're not familiar with reddit it's simply like a message forum they've got different rooms and stuff like that so this particular person had written their story. And again, we'll, we'll dissect it a little bit, but uh, it created quite a bit of, of traction or it got quite a bit of cra uh, traction and created uh, quite a bit of reaction. The subject was, I met Tom DeLong and Luis Elizondo, and these are my thoughts. Uh, and so this uh, essentially breaks down his entire story that he has conveyed to everyone else. Now, I will not go over it in its entirety. I invite you guys to read it in its entirety, uh, but in order for me to break down every single character, line, and word uh, would take hours, and I don't want to bore you guys to death. I want to get through this as quickly as I can. But this story linked in the show notes below, or if you're listening on a podcast, it's in the description. I've also linked over to my article, which links to everything that I'm talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as I mentioned, uh, before we get into really breaking down the story, this particular person reached out to me in 2019. February to be exact. And the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, why they wanted to, to reach out according to them was they wanted to uh, essentially share some information, nothing classified. And I want to stress that there was never any secret, anything that was shared. It was never on behalf of of the US government. This just happened to be an employee of the US government, namely US Army counterintelligence. So I want to stress that up front that nothing was ever shared that was not supposed to be shared. This was just a conversation between people. He just happened to have been, uh, again, US Army counterintelligence. So again, he reached out to me in early 2019. According to him, uh, he felt that I dealt with facts and evidence. And he liked that about the Black Vault and me personally felt that it would be a beneficial you know, relationship just to share information, you know, essentially talk UFOs. I've met amazing people over the years. And this particular person, when they reached out, was not um, uh, uh, like an out of the ordinary bad person. You get those red flags all the time. Sometimes people reach out to you and go, oh, boy, you know, this is definitely not uh, going to be someone that I'm going to jive with. Um, but rather, this was somebody that uh, really seemed down to earth and somebody I wanted to talk to. And so we, we began corresponding. Uh, they wanted to share information and their experience with trying to figure out what the UFO phenomena was or is, uh, what ATIP was or is, uh, and essentially everything that came along with it. And so that is that is kind of the root of the contact in 2019. I'm going to jump around only because I will not share private communications, not only with this particular person or uh, anybody that I correspond with without permission. So I'm going to jump to what they posted publicly. And I will tell you, and I put it there on the top right corner, consistency is key. I can tell you after two and a half years, rereading my old emails with them and then reading their story they posted publicly it's completely consistent nothing changed no facts altered generally you see that with people that are telling a tall tale uh, it was not like what i would call a fine wine story that gets better with age i hate those uh, and it's always a red flag quite the opposite it was very very um spot on to what we had chatted about in 2019 so the quotes that i'm pulling are from what what you guys can read. I'm just here to say what happened in 2019 reflects what they said in 2021. Let me read the introduction paragraph. 
I am a U.S. Army counterintelligence agent. This will be the first time I've posted something on Reddit in the 10 years I've been here that runs the risk of someone being able to figure out who I am based on the story I'm about to tell. But I'm nearly retired, so I think I'm probably all right. Based on that, I believe that probably the uh, retirement uh, age and uh, the, the, that, or excuse me, retirement date uh, being approaching, I think probably relaxed him uh, to telling the story publicly, albeit anonymously, but kind of relaxed a little bit. In 2019, as I mentioned, they didn't want to go on the record, which is why I never ran the story anyway. Um, but uh, had some great conversations and learned along the way. But I think now with that retirement date looming, that probably plays a role. And I think that that's why he introduced the story that way. <clears throat> Where there's a quote, I'll tell you, uh, if you're watching the screen, it is in red. Those are going to be the quotes. I've paraphrased some stuff as well. So you guys can follow along. And again, I've condensed this. So I'm going to take you back to Thanksgiving of 2018. And I'm going to refer to the counterintelligence agent rather than just continually saying counterintelligence agent as the op. Uh, that is more of a internet acronym for original poster. It's quick and it will allow this to go a lot smoother for me. So when you hear me say op, that is what I am referring to as the counterintelligence agent and his original post. Sometimes people think op is original post. It could be original poster, whatever. You hear me say op, that's who I'm referring to. So Thanksgiving of 2018, the op met some people involved with the old Project Stargate uh, that were still around for him to meet, uh, I'm assuming, in the Pentagon. One was a colonel who provided cover support for the Project uh, Stargate program, and UFOs were jokingly brought up. Uh, the op then asked, have you heard of, uh, was then asked, uh, meaning, have you heard of Luis Elizondo? He was asked by one of the older Project Stargate people. That was how the op was kind of made aware of Luis Elizondo in Thanksgiving of uh, 2018. Speeding up the story, he figured out where Elizondo was. At this time, he was with To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science. So he reached out and wanted to speak with uh, Luis Elizondo. He did so the next day. Apparently, they had uh, about an hour-long, 30 minutes, hour-long conversation on the telephone, uh, and they began uh, speaking one-on-one -on -one and privately. To quote the op on that experience, I will uh, read what he says. The biggest takeaways from this conversation were the three questions I asked and his answers to them. Number one, what made you believe? He responded with, you know the videos in the news? The stuff that's still classified is way crazier. Obviously, Mr. Elizondo is referring to the FLIR, the gimbal, and the GoFast. Number two, is ATIP still a thing because the media says it's defunct? Mr. Elizondo says it absolutely still is a thing. Question three, can I get a job with ATIP as an Army CI or counterintelligence guy to do investigations? Luis Elizondo says, absolutely. We'll set up a meeting. Now we're going to fast forward to January of 2019. January of 2019, uh, Mr. Elizondo sends a invitation uh, to the op to meet at the Crystal Gateway Marriott in Virginia, which is just outside of the Pentagon. If that seems oddly specific, it is, and put a pin in that because we'll deal with it again, but also that is one of those consistent points that goes back to 2019 that I was told that does pan out uh, as being the locale of this meeting. But stay tuned because the pin that you're putting in there, uh, in my opinion, is, is kind of a doozy. So Tom DeLong was there at the meeting. According to the op, that was unexpected. He did not expect Tom DeLong to be there at all. There are also two other gentlemen. Uh, they are not named in the story, so we don't know their identities, according to uh, this story, but they were also there. When the op arrived, there was some, I guess, some irrelevant conversations that he makes note of. Uh, it had nothing to do with UFOs, or, or if it did, he wasn't sure, but he, he says it's irrelevant to this conversation. So the uh, team, the DeLong, Elizondo, and two gentlemen were already there, and then op walked in kind of in the middle of it. I'm going to read a quote. Some of the key things from this meeting that I want to point out are, number one, 
They said that they had recovered fragments from UFO sightings slash encounters and showed me several photos on their phone of what looked to be regular metallic slag or melted chunks of debris. They also had chemical analysis reports they showed me copies of. Now, I got an A in college chemistry, but having like 15 seconds to look at these things and them not being willing to provide copies, I couldn't tell you what the hell those reports said or if they contained anything noteworthy or really anything indicating these metallic lumps were from potentially extraterrestrial origin or whatever. One final thing they mentioned was the supposed existence of what they referred to as a biological specimen. When I exhibited a bit of surprise over this, Elizondo pointed to the two gentlemen from the Pentagon and said, they know about it. It belongs to the U.S. government. This will be important later. All right, that's the end of the quote. At one point during this meeting, according to the op, Elizondo and the two gentlemen had left the table. I think he was seeing them out from what I gathered from the story. And that left Tom DeLong and the op behind. I'm going to read another quote. During that portion of this encounter, he made the statement to me, meaning DeLong to the op, that there were incidents of some type of creatures coming through portals on Earth. And in one incident, these creatures used some kind of weapon to turn a dog into a grease stain. He also mentioned that there was some kind of Cold War or equivalent to the Syria situation taking place between a species of extraterrestrial that is already here under the oceans and another from somewhere else that is currently on the moon. Being that I was trying to be polite, still in seeking a job with the ATIP mode, I listened and didn't really argue or ask a lot of hard-hitting questions, just nodded and heard these guys out. At the conclusion of this meeting, Elizondo set me up with the two gentlemen at the Pentagon, and I left. That's the end of the quote. That really sounds DeLong-esque. I know that's third-party information, but obviously Tom DeLong is very, very well known for saying some very outlandish uh, and unfounded statements like that. So it really kind of jives uh, with, again, a, a DeLong-esque kind of story. But uh, take it for, for what you'd like. Fast forwarding now on the timeline to February of 2019, the end of February to be exact. This is when the op met the two gentlemen at the Pentagon. I'm going to read you another quote. During this hour-long meeting in the Pentagon, we discussed a number of things. First, I obviously asked about the biological specimen mentioned in the first meeting. They demurred and said, if there was one, we don't know where it is, probably been moved between who knows how many warehouses by now. I asked them about ATIP and recounted my discussion with Elizondo and the potential for possibly working with slash for ATIP. They explained that ATIP went defunct due to a funding issue and that though it still existed, it was currently as of then active or excuse me, it wasn't currently as of then active. Forgive me. We discussed some other stuff. One thing, which I won't recount because they claimed it was secret slash no foreign or no foreign intelligence, but I will recount the thing they claimed was top secret slash SCI or special compartmentalized information. Don't get too excited yet. Continuing the quote, they told me of an incident where an Italian helicopter was literally shot by a UAP and had to make an emergency landing and that they had obtained this information from the Italians. This will be important later. Also, for IC professionals or intelligence community professionals reading this who might have just had a mild stroke, it turns out that this wasn't classified information. So chill TF out. (laughs) Moving on. The final bit we discussed, which I thoroughly agree with, was that in the 1940s, when the UFO craze took off, the U.S. government at the time had to choose between dealing with the USSR and the start of the Cold War and or dealing with potential hysteria at home due to the flying saucers people were reporting. So the National Security Council at the time decided to work to debunk, marginalize, and ridicule the UFO slash flying saucer subject. And it, through those initial efforts, continued efforts throughout the 1900s and via the plethora of fringe nonsense today that kept this subject marginalized. That meeting concluded, and that was the last I saw of those two guys. On a side note, I agree with uh, pretty much the end of that summation there about the 1940s and essentially 
marginalizing the UFO flying saucer topic, but that is something else entirely. But at least that part of the conversation kind of rang true. Interesting, though, the op, what he would call a runaround, uh, getting a runaround, that he was being told about this classified information, uh, but it actually wasn't classified information. In fact, Tom DeLong had put it on his Instagram and it showed up on on uh, uh, later on unidentified, uh, unidentified, so it wasn't classified information at all. Uh, but on top of that, uh, the nothing panned out for him working within the ATIP thing. And then on top of that, the biological specimen that he was essentially teased about uh, or teased with. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is kind of like dangling the carrot. Pentagon says, yeah, we have no idea where that might be. So now fast forward to July of 2019. Now, this is another quote. I watched Unidentified, and this is from the op, by the way, if you haven't figured it out. I watched Unidentified, and when we got to the part of the show where they had filmed that meeting in that hotel, I was shocked. In my opinion, that was pretty shady of Tom DeLonge and Luis Elizondo to have that meeting take place and secretly have a cameraman up on the second floor of the lobby without notifying us. So that meeting that I just went over is the exact same meeting that took place in Unidentified. Now, this particular meeting was deemed as this, here's a closer look of the shot from the show, that these were allegedly, anyway, the military officers that were running the current ATIP effort. That's how it was branded. That got a lot of traction online. People were really excited. We see that Tom DeLong and Luis Elizondo are right there in the middle of it. It very mo much looks like this clandestine meeting with, with someone in fatigues and then what potentially look like two other, maybe, I, I can't really tell if they're suits or maybe dress blue type uniforms or whatever. Um, but regardless, I mean, it, it very much lended credibility to what Elizondo, DeLong, and everybody was doing with TTSA, that they were right in the middle of it. Now, going back when this uh, aired, I had spoken to the op, as I mentioned, in February through, you know, maybe uh, March-ish. I, I don't have all the timestamps uh, in front of me, but uh, regardless, uh, around that time frame, And then this aired in June, and I remembered that the op and I did not talk for a little bit. And then all of a sudden I got this message like, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, this is not what the email says, but like, oh my gosh, that meeting that you saw on Unidentified, that is what I was, that's what I told you about because he had mentioned uh, meeting everybody and, uh, and, and, and shared that information. Because again, it wasn't classified. There was no indicator that anything was classified. So then he sees himself on television that there was cameras that were rolling at least one of the people at this table, including DeLong and Elizondo. And he had no idea. The op had no idea. But once they told me this and that that was the location of the interview, I started putting two and two together. I wanted to challenge the op because I thought, okay, look, I'm always apprehensive about believing people. And what he's told me up to this point was just about a meeting and sharing information. And, and again, we shared some other stuff as well, but, but um, nothing, again, of a secretive nature or classified nature. It was just essentially what we all do, or hopefully most of us do, is just communicate with other people, share information, see how we can help each other. But I wanted to challenge it a little bit. I thought, okay, was this really... Like, is that really the op stand in there? And um, what's going on? I had already vetted the person up to a point already as much as you, you could. Um, I can, and I want to be careful. So you may hear me kind of be a little reluctant because I don't want to blow anybody's, I respect anonymity. I don't want to blow anybody's identity. What I can comfortably say is they wrote from a military address to prove who they were in the beginning. Um so the, and there was no attempt to shield identity. That's always a red flag for me. So when people come to me and they, I'm not going to tell you my name. I, I work for the CIA, and they're writing me from like Gmail. Uh, that's always kind of a you know a red flag. This particular person had zero 
problems uh, with their identity, with me knowing their identity, um, as as you would quite expect. They asked me not to share it, you know, and blast out, "Hey, I'm talking to so and so." Uh, so of course I would, I would oblige with that, but they never tried to hide identities whatsoever. So they were writing from a military address. Um, on top of that, then, uh, there were a couple other resources that I was able to look at and, and completely could verify that they were U S army counterintelligence. I don't want to go farther than that. Other than, uh, I will show you some quotes from the law enforcement officer that will explain a little bit more about verification and how that works and how you look at people's identities and so on. So I'm not trying to be secretive, but rather I'm going to let a law enforcement officer tell you that uh, rather than me uh, try and, and <laughs> you know, ex explain every little tidbit to you. So the credentials had already checked out, but I thought, okay, look, if, if this particular person's telling me that they were at the Crystal Gateway Marriott outside the Pentagon, let's take a look. So when you watch episode six of season one of Unidentified, uh, you'll see here on the left of your screen, if you're watching the video, a scene between DeLong and Luis Elizondo, and they're essentially getting ready for this meeting with, as was termed to be the military officers that are running ATIP. And I noticed here on the wall was a very unique, and I'm not sure if my arrow's coming through onto the video, so I'll find out later. I'm kind of doing this presentation a little different than normal as a test. So I'm not sure if you can see it. I usually have a laser pointer, but regardless to the left of the frame, if you're not seeing my arrow is a unique mirror. I think it's playing off of the crystal part of the Crystal Gateway Marriott. So it looks like a bunch of crystals. It's silver if you're not looking at the video uh, and it's a mirror circular in shape. So I thought, okay, let's go to the hotel. Uh, and so online, there's tons of pictures of it. You can get virtual walkthroughs of the rooms and conference centers. You'll see here on the right hand of your screen, the exact same mirror. It was a match. So very unique design and essentially the ops description of where this all went down uh, was spot on. You'll also see a desk lamp in both frames. You'll see that they are absolutely a match as well. You will see out the window here, very much a high rise. I didn't bank everything on that fact, uh, but you'll see it's very, very similar. So uh, essentially you're looking at a match on the hotel. If you need more evidence, here's another shot of DeLong going through what is assumed to be the lobby of some kind of the hotel on his way. You'll see a light pillar slightly out of focus there in the middle of that frame. Look to the right. Here's a, from the Crystal Gateway Marriott website. I was able to find that exact same light pillar all the way in the background here. That's probably where he was walking through because those pillars kind of match. Uh, if you look closely, there's TVs way in the background. You'll see TVs here. Um, I was never able to really pinpoint if this was where they were. I think that camera person who secretly took the shot was on this elevator here, or excuse me, escalator here, and that they shot down into this area here. But th that part's a little speculation on my end. The, the photos were limited. Regardless, there's enough matches to show this op new exact where everything took place. So I was in 2019, not only convinced of the ops credentials, but convinced he was there. There was no way that you could uh, get around it. One of the, the other things I'll point out to you, and again, uh, I'm going to be a little reluctant here with all the details because I respect uh, the ops anonymity, but the physical appearance of the op uh, is uh, you can tell in the video, regardless of a blurred face, uh, it is and was a match. Uh, so the culmination of all of that for me in 2019 made me realize, okay, from what I could check out from locale, from credentials to the physical appearance of the person, it was a match to who was sitting at that table. And I was a little mind blown that the scene was misrepresented. Now, if you may or may not think that that's all that big of a deal, stay tuned because I'll get into why that's kind of a big deal and why we should worry about the accuracy of stuff like that. Now, I did mention the law enforcement officer who also vetted him. I got a statement from him. I also got an audio recording. I'm not going to play that for you in this particular video. It's close to 10 minutes long, but I'll probably do a companion video for you guys to see. But let me read the condensed quoted version. Um, and again, I was uh, authorized by this, this person to give both out to you. On Reddit, you will know them as the Sublime Goose. Uh, they are 
the uh, moderator of the aliens forum. This is one of the people that was contacted. I don't know the total number of people, but one of the people that was contacted uh, to vet the the op and this U.S. Army counterintelligence agent. And this is uh, what they had to say to me and to all of you. Here's a quote. Alleged ACI agent, Army counterintelligence agent, contacted the r slash aliens moderator team on their own accord. Given that I'm a veteran and current civilian law enforcement officer, he was handed over to me for verification purposes. When discussing what could be used to verify him, he offered to email me from a military email ad- address, and while I declined, he provided that address to me. I'm going to assume that's the same one he was corresponding with me over as well. While some users wanted to see his CAC or the Common Access Card slash Military ID, I'm aware that special agents of Army Counter Intel are issued federal law enforcement officer credentials. I requested to see his FLEO cre- cre- credentials, which he supplied to me. I have no reason to doubt their authenticity, although I have not officially looked into them. They looked legitimate to me and would fool me on the street. I have no reason to believe that they are fake. Um, In the audio version, very quickly, this particular law enforcement officer goes into detail about how, you know, you can flash badges, you can buy those, they're a dime a dozen online. Those types of identification cards and badges and stuff like that don't mean anything. What the um, law enforcement officer's point was here was that he went for something that is much more rare that it's not something you just go to your you know internet uh, whatever dot com address and type up you know what your your name is and then they send you an id card uh you can do that with police badges but badges it's very scary how easy it is to get those types of things and they are just spot on identical um and it's legal sadly uh but that being said this particular person went after credentials that were not so common and nailed it so Again, there's a third party verification. You don't need to take my word for it. Other people looked at him as well. So why does it all matter? You know, why, you know, I I saw quite a few different comments online that number one, I was tacking Luis Elizondo. And let me let me just quickly address that. I laugh because I've had many private conversations now with Luis Elizondo explaining to him that these online trolls are completely taking things out of context and that if he ever has any questions for me or wants me to clarify uh, that I'm always happy to do that. And we've shared some nice conversations and I have had the opportunity to clarify certain things that I think he realized were very much misconstrued by the trolls out there. So I I don't speak for him in, 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 in any way, but I just wanted to bring that up, that this is getting out of control. In the actual article, I specifically state that I don't blame Luis Elizondo or Tom DeLonge because, in my opinion, uh, they likely may have not even have known. I don't know that for a fact, but they may not have even known that this was uh, happening, meaning that this meeting that they were having was filmed secretly. Uh, And why I say that is a very quick preface that I'll give you that goes back to, ironically, about the same time that the op that we've been talking about, Thanksgiving of 2018, that I was contacted by the crew of the show Unidentified. Uh, Now, yet again, I won't share private communications, but I will give you the quick summation that I was asked to be on season one of Unidentified. Uh, The premise, from what I understood, was just probably a one-episode appearance. Um, and without going into too much detail, cause again, it's, it's a creative thing on their side and I don't want to blow it. Essentially. I think that they were trying to get Luis Elizondo and I together, uh, in a room at this time, we had never talked. I was trying to reach out to him. So they were, in my opinion, uh, based on what I heard kind of creating this in again, opinion, uh, a very kind of lame reality show moment. And I was not down for that. I don't do those types of shows. I don't care for those types of shows. Uh, And it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to Luis Elizondo. Uh, It wasn't fair to me. And um, I also expressed concerns about the creative control. Tom DeLonge was doing a lot of interviews around this time that they essentially, like this was their show that they had creative control. Um, I'm paraphrasing some of his interviews, but he was talking a lot about that. And I had a concern. 
It's no secret that even to this day, uh, some within or all of them, I don't know, uh, TTSA circle, they don't like me. So here was the crew coming to me, the executive coming to me saying, uh, you know, will you appear? I had spoken to a couple different uh, people and it uh, names are it doesn't matter. Uh, but I can tell you it was an executive producer level and then one uh, under, which was the one that initiated the contact. And so and the reason why I say EP is there's like 20 of them credited. So, again, I'm not trying to, to point fingers at people, uh, just trying to res respect um, people's involvement. So that being said, uh, I had respectfully turned it down based on my expression of that uh, concern that, you know, here I was signing a release that, that they could do anything. Because when you sign those releases, they can make fun of you and you can't sue. I mean, they, they can do whatever they want, depending upon that uh, wording of, of the release. And I was told back in 2000, late 2018 that Tom DeLonge and To The Stars Academy, this is the only thing I'll share that was told to me privately, had no creative control, that it was A&E Network's control. Uh, that was very much in line with what I was used to working for A&E. You can all look me up on IMDb. I worked for A&E Network's History Channel extensively uh, for, for quite a few years. I don't do it anymore. I run my own business away from the Black Vault and uh, away from television. Uh, but I've got quite a few credits under my belt. So that was more along the lines of what I was under the impression of, but with Tom DeLong saying, oh, we've got full control and editorial approval and this and that, that didn't seem right because A&E foots the bills on this unless it's called a co-production deal. So it goes, it spirals on from there. Um, so that was really my concern. Uh, that was put to rest, but I still respectfully declined. Uh, we parted ways, uh, hopefully on good terms, uh, but I, it just wasn't my forte. Uh, it just wasn't it. So I wanted to tell you that part of the story just simply because of my next point uh, that a lot of people have asked me, well, why didn't you get Luis Elizondo's reaction? And here's why. For the last couple of years, I've been told and led to believe that they didn't have creative control. So it would be unfair for me to do this to Luis Elizondo where I run to him and I go, okay, man, how did this happen? And he's put in a pickle. He has a couple decisions to make. He answers me. And I pit him against the executive producer or the executive team or creative team or a &E networks as a whole. I pit him against them, which is not a fair position. I was told he didn't have creative control. I don't believe that that was a lie. So why would I go and confront him about this or get statements, uh, you know, even if I sugarcoated it? Uh, that was not fair to him. And, and truly, I don't believe in putting people in positions like that because on the other end, he could say, you know what, John, I, I, I don't want to comment on this uh, because uh, I don't want to comment, period. So then I publish, Luis Elizondo declines to comment. There's no way to publish a declines to comment without allegations flying, right? There's, there's just nothing. If I said he wasn't available for comment, I'd be lying then. So if he said I, I declined to comment, which is actually the right answer, uh, you know, then allegations will fly that he's covering it up, that he knows it's fake. It was a position that I was not going to put him into, and it was not fair. So I made the decision not even to do it. I, I Originally, this was a social media post, and that's it. Uh, but it got lengthy because I went into detail. So I put it on a page, but no quotes or anything other than the op. The, the story was about the op story, the experience there. And then I added kind of my two cents about the production side, because that's my that's my angle and how unfair it is for productions to misrepresent the scenes that they're that they're showing on camera, because if this was according to uh, the show anyway, uh, I'll read you what Luis Elizondo said in the show. These are individuals that have to remain very, very much protected. There are extremely qualified people whom I trust, whom I personally know, that are still st running this effort. And it is being run with official blessing. And that is what I'm prepared to say. I cannot go into any more than that. That was what Luis Elizondo said. And then they led into this meeting. Now, some of you may think, oh, wait a minute, John, you said you're not... Um, blaming Luis Elizondo, yet here he is setting up the meeting. Well, here is my good faith, 
I'm hoping that this is not true. He could very well have been answering something else. And the producers chose to put it in to make it seem like this lunchtime meeting that they had breaking from their production schedule. This could have been just a lunch between friends. A producer comes down the escalator, films some shots, and then creates a dramatized scenario in the show. Yet again, if I bring that up to Luis Elizondo or Tom DeLong, although DeLong has never returned any of my messages, but not that I blame him. I mean, he probably doesn't like me, but uh, regardless, uh, if I presented that to them, what are they going to say? Oh, yes, all this was fabricated. And yet again, you pit the talent of a TV show against their executive producers. And whether we all want the answers or not, I would love to ask. It just wasn't fair. And I made the decision not to do it. But regardless, that is what was said and how it was framed in this interview. I did uh, tag the executive, one of the executive producers that I knew used Twitter. Uh, they won't answer if the scene was accurate. Unfortunately, and this is a quote from Anthony LePay, Again, the one of the executive producers on Unidentified, he says, unfortunately, as I've said before, I can't comment on the show per similar agreements all producers have with networks. Uh, there was some Twitter banter. I won't go over everything with you, but I will say this. I worked for History Channel, as I mentioned, and a &E Networks quite a bit. I never was ever told I could not answer a question on whether or not my nonfiction show was accurately portrayed or a scene. I've never. Speaking on behalf of the network, of course, you can't do that, uh, nor would I, nor was I asking Anthony. What I was just asking was, hey, you guys set this up in a nonfiction show as a meeting between military officers. Is that accurate? Uh, and they wouldn't comment. So I'm not going to fault Anthony for it. I mean, hey, with all due respect, he's the executive producer, wants to fall back on the network. Uh, that's fine. I have reached out to A&E Networks. I have not heard back yet. Obviously, we're in the holiday season, so who knows when or if I will get a response, but I have done that. Uh, just haven't heard anything. Will they comment on a 2019 airing of one of their series? No idea. Um, so we'll, we'll cross that bridge if they ever respond to it. Uh, but I will say, and let me switch over. Cause again, this is uh, just kind of a new way I'm doing things. I'm going to play a video for you guys. This is one of the other executive producers, uh, of the unidentified show or credited as an executive producer. Uh, and we'll hear what he has to say about accuracy and telling people the truth from a lot of citizens who have questions but usually they just don't talk to them they just ignore them somehow you were able to not not only get people on the phone but get people on the record and start really getting stuff out to the public that had never been available before and that's a is that just due to your sheer tenacity it really kind of was uh, i basically the very beginning of it i was playing a lot of very important people off each other it was really kind of funny i was just making things up i was like hey i'm talking to so-and-so and i go to that guy i'm like hey i'm talking to so-and-so and you weren't talking to anybody oh i kind of was was but it was more like handshakes and hellos <laughs> you know um so they believed you were talking to somebody else so they thought oh it's safe it's to kind, legit. kind of i mean they hear from a lot of so that is tom DeLong again the executive producer of the unidentified series obviously the creator of to the stars academy obviously he was laughing about it and he was telling about how, in essence, he was telling stories that weren't true. In order to get somebody to speak with him, he was telling them something that wasn't true or only partially true. Very much echoes what we're talking about today in that unidentified series. Now, I'll say it again. I don't just by default blame him, but that's his mindset. And that, by the way, was from K-Rock's... Um, Kevin and Bean show, or at least they were on K-Rock. I may, may be wrong now. I'm in LA, so they were in LA for a long, long time. But they're Kevin and Bean. Uh, and so he did that interview in the last year or two. So that's his mindset. If he wants something, that he will fabricate or misrepresent something in order to get it. And uh, it's funny the reaction of some people online about that because I posted that video, the same clip I played for all of you on Twitter. And it's funny to see the reaction because a lot of people go, yeah, I mean, it's just a, for him, it's, it's, it's a game, you know, it's, it's not truthful. And how do we know what to believe for others? They were cheering it on, you know, and they're, they're saying, yeah, go Tom, you know, give it right back to the government. They've been lying to us. So let's lie to them. Who cares? We get what we want. Uh, in that respect, I don't think the ends justify the means. 
But I think that that brings up a whole different part of this conversation that's very frustrating for me to bring up. But I think it has to be said, especially with this new story that we've been talking about where a U.S. Army counterintelligence agent comes out and says, hey, I was the one that was sitting on that table. I'm not a military officer running a tip. This was a lunch hour break meeting in a hotel lobby with, yeah, two people from the Pentagon, but totally not what we were led to believe. We can't just dismiss that because it's a television show and there's creative license. I saw a lot of that. Well, who cares? It's just TV. Well, this isn't an isolated incident. And I think what people are doing right now, which for me is kind of frightening as we live in very exciting times and the Gillibrand Amendment and the NDAA passed and we potentially are going to be getting more UFO information and hopefully some transparency. When you build that that house of cards on a rocky foundation, what's going to happen? I mean, eventually it's going to collapse. You look at the, the mid to late 60s and Gerald Ford's push for UFO transparency and, and scientific scrutiny and so on. And we ended up with the Condon report and they shut down all UFO investigations for decades upon decades. Could stuff like this play a role? And again, it doesn't just end with the television show because it goes much, much more. And I think people are moving the goalpost when it comes to some of these stories that as new information comes out and essentially rewrites the old story that we were once told was the truth, that they move the goalpost and go, well, well, that doesn't really matter. Oh, Tom DeLong lied to those people. That, that, that doesn't matter. He's not lying to us. He lied to them. And that's okay. You know, and, and those types of, there's no other way to put it. Those, those, those efforts to move the goalpost are a problem. And, and I'll, I'll give you a prime example. Uh, and <laughs> this will get some, this will get some feathers ruffled for sure by some people, uh, but I will continue talking about this because I think it's poor important. This entire issue has gone on since day one. And I remember when, when the information about the videos came out and uh, you'll see here with the screenshots on the screen, uh, every one of those videos per to the stars Academy. And, and again, kudos to them for bringing them out. Uh, they were saying that they were, they went through the official U S government declassification review process and approved for public release. That's how they were framed in December of 2017 and go fast in March of 2018 uh, that there was, and you'll see here by the second screenshot, this content has chain of custody documentation to ensure preservation of its original condition. For those who have watched the black vault for a long time, you'll know I had huge problems with all of those statements because none of it made sense. Chain of custody wouldn't even apply in this instance. And there was no indication that anything went through the declassification process, especially after the paperwork leaked out. Once it was released via the FOIA, we realized none of those statements were true. Nothing went through the declassification process because not to get technical, it wasn't even classified to begin with. But on top of that, it was considered for official use only and was only supposed to be used internally. Everybody hated me for that. And yet, it turned out to be true. In fact, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations did a full investigation on this. We didn't know this until years later. What was their conclusion? That stuff never should have been out and never given to the media. Then we have Christopher Mellon. He says, quote, this is a case where somebody bent the rules a little bit and they did so for the larger good and we are absolutely all better off because of it. Well, going through a declassification process with chain of custody information is not bending the rules. That was a lie. So who bent the rules? Now, some people think, well, Luis Elizondo did all of this legitimately. Well, keep in mind, he told me he played no role in it. And I was pretty floored in that section of my interview with him because he told me that when he filed this form here, the DD form 1910, I received this under the Freedom of Information Act. You'll see here, and it may be hard to read, that essentially it was for U.S. government internal use only. And that was it. And he told me it was never meant to be given to the media. Now, I was surprised. He was with To The Stars Academy. December 2017, To The Stars Academy obviously was involved with the New York Times article. And he told me that he wasn't not only wasn't the one that provided it to the New York Times in this particular uh, interview, but he also couldn't recall if he was even aware 
that to the Stars Academy had the videos. Now, if he didn't give it to them, and I'm not saying he's lying, but if he didn't give it to them, who did? If Luis Elizondo filed the paperwork and we were told everything was on the up and up, but now Luis Elizondo is saying, oh, no, this was for internal use only. Chris Mellon got it. And he also says in this interview with me that he doesn't want to know where Christopher Mellon got it. So he doesn't ask. So, so according to Mr. Elizondo, he has no idea who gave the information to Christopher Mellon. That also was a surprise to me. Um, then where did this come from? Who else is orchestrating this? Now, some of you may not be aware, but there was a Christop what they call the Christopher Mellon leak. And it wasn't even really a leak. It was just stored on his web server, Christopher Mellon's website. And somebody, I believe his name was Twitter J, he was known as, uh, not a hacker. It was nothing illegal. They were just kind of snooping around a little bit and stumbled on some files. Well, on there were the likely CD or DVD discs with the unclassified DOD envelope that was given to Luis Elizondo from an R Essex, likely inside the Pentagon. Chris Mellon is a handwritten here at four o'clock, 1600 hours on 9 7 2017. So if Luis Elizondo didn't give it to Chris Mellon, where did this envelope come from? Did somebody take it from Luis Elizondo? Something doesn't make sense here. But again, it plays into this whole thing. This isn't just a television show. Who cares? A, a scene was misrepresented. No, this goes on and has gone on since day one of since a tip has come around. Another example I'll give you guys is a full presentation I recently did on skinwalkers at the Pentagon and how the entire ATIP story, the narrative that we were spun in from the New York Times and Politico was wrong. Quotes from the book say, quote, unfortunately, the ATIP details presented in these articles and news programs were actually those of OSAP at, and in fact, many of those details themselves were in error. Another quote, one of the purposes of this book is to correct the record. In other words, Politico, New York Times, infamous for breaking the story. Well, according to James Lekatsky, who was the director of the OSAP program, Dr. Calm Kelleher, who was a government contractor through Bass, and George Knapp, who is a journalist, they're all saying that all of that was wrong. Do we believe them? Now, without actually blaming Luis Elizondo, in my opinion, they throw shade his direction and say the main source for the Times article was Lou Elizondo, who had recently resigned, who had recently resigned from his Pentagon position and joined TTSA and director of global security and special programs. Well, if you're saying that the article is completely wrong and then you say, here's the main source of it all, aren't you saying that the main source messed up Times 2? Because they're saying both the New York Times and Politico. I'm not saying Luis Elizondo was wrong. I'll be honest with you. I shy away from the Lukatsky book and lean towards Elizondo more because at least he hasn't wavered. At least he's been around for a while. Uh, now we get a new book and all of a sudden we're supposed to question everything. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I believe for whatever reason, it is not just a scene in a TV show. And it messes people up, the investigators like you, like me, the curious minds, to try and figure all of this out. Because when you see information that, according to Unidentified, is officially sanctioned, you know, and these meetings, secret meetings are taking place. In my world, in the investigative world, that's called actionable intel. All right. I know that's probably an intelligence community phrasing, but I use that in a research sense as well. Anything that you can track the paperwork around is actionable intel to me, and I will be all over it. If everything is all muddy watered and, and completely skewed away from the truth, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of resources, and it's a waste of how far we actually have come with this particular topic. And if we continue down this route, Again, I go back to the 1960s where you get congressional hearings or you get a congressional push for transparency, you get whatever you get, but in the end, it's the Condon report, then what the heck is the point? Which is why accuracy matters, which is why we should get the facts. I created this massive timeline, which I labeled navigating the twisted maze of the ATIP timeline, literally put points 
over the course of a couple of years to show how confusing and conflicting all of this is. Now, as I record this, it drastically needs to be updated. But regardless, you can actually see, and I'll point out one last thing to you, is simply the relationship between ATIP and OSAP and what was it. And I can tell you that the U.S. government, Luis Elizondo, Dr. Hal Putoff, and now Dr. James Lekatsky as of the last couple of months, all have varying definitions for what what OSAP was, what ATIP was, and what their relationship was. They're all different. Yet all four of them are all the insiders. You've got the government, which is the ultimate inside. You've got Luis Elizondo, who said he headed ATIP. You have Dr. James Lekatsky, who said he uh, headed OSAP. You have Dr. Hal Putoff, who says that he was the head of the Bass part, the private sector part of OSAP. And then in the book, you have another thing called Bass OSAP or OSAP Bass or whichever way it is of those documents. So not DIA. So what is all of that, right? And people wonder why I make full videos about how confusing this ultimately is. Is that the intent though? When I told you about how much of a waste of time it is, we should call out television scenes between military officers that are fake. Because if that all is fabricated, I hope that those that were involved with that speak out. Why? Because we need to hear it. We need to understand that that is not what this field needs. But then on top of that, we need the real facts. Why can't we get them? Why can't the government insiders, those that were intimately involved in all of this, agree? Why does one insider blame the other insider for ultimately the mainstream media getting the root of all of this wrong? Is the house of cards going to shake a little bit? Is it going to fall? I don't know. But all I can say is, is how frustrating and time consuming it actually is to sift through all this. And I kind of wonder, is that the point? Is it the point to get people so frustrated that you rather just sit back and take whatever information that bleeds to you, true or not, partially true, who cares, but at least you're not pushing for answers anymore and you essentially leave the cover up alone. I'm not in the disinformation camp or psyop, psyop camp. I know that, that that's been around for a while. I'm not there. But it starts to make you wonder after all of this piles up, and I could keep going, but I'm, I'm already at about an hour here. I could keep going, but it piles up about the crap that has spewed out there from all corners of the story, from the heroes and the villains of the story alike. And yes, to many, I'm the villain. But regardless, the, 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 the crap that has gone out there uh, that, that is spewed is ridiculous. It really is. And, and, and I put myself in that category. I was making this video and going, I don't want to, I don't want to do these OSAP a tip videos anymore, but you just have to, because there's so much that, that comes out that you just have to, you have to digest it. You have to deal with it. You have to understand it because if you cherry pick the information and you only allow people to see certain things or you, you deny yourself from seeing all the evidence. What are you involved in the conversation for anyway? Your mind is already made up. And I truly, like I was doing this going, this is, this is so tedious, but it does make you wonder, is that part of the plan? They get you so set on a certain narrative and then you get comfortable with it. And then another curveball comes. Skinwalkers at the Pentagon is a prime example. I was so set that, that a tip, and Luis Elizondo and $22 million, albeit I have a lot of unanswered questions and there's a lot of red flags still, at least you start settling into a narrative and you keep digging at it. Then all of a sudden over here, a brand new book comes and goes, yeah, New York Times, wrong. Politico, wrong. $22 million, nah, he didn't get it. We did over here. He was a small effort. We were the real one. So just when you're getting comfortable with what's over here, Regardless of you agreeing with everything, at least there's a comfort level because you've heard about it for three, four years. Then something else comes. And for the good old price of $17.99, they turn everything upside down. And that is incredibly frustrating, but it makes you wonder whether or not it's intentional. I'll leave you with the words 
of the op, going back to his story in a quote that I think sums it up nicely, though, although strongly worded, uh, it shows the confusion and how hard it is to really unravel this. He says, quote, I don't know exactly what their entire angle was slash is, meaning TTSA, Louisa, that entire meeting, everything. I don't know exactly what their entire angle was slash is regarding all of this. Their publicly stated stance is one of disclosure, but the way they interacted with me and the runaround I experienced in the effing Pentagon put a bad taste in my mouth. I'm not going to sit here and call their entire endeavor BS because I don't think on some level it is. There are too many stories from the witnesses they interviewed for it simply to be complete nonsense. But I have maintained from the beginning that something is a bit off, especially with the way Elizondo's involvement started, how he went out, how he went about all of this, and the nature of the subject itself. Personally, my first thought was that this was all a giant smokescreen and part of some kind of deception operation the U.S. government is running to cover up for something else. What that could be, who knows? That's a U.S. Army counterintelligence agent. I think he sums it up nicely. I think he obviously has a bad taste in his mouth, and maybe he um, is still trying to, to figure this out as well, and maybe that's strongly worded against Elizondo personally. I'll leave all of that up to you to decide. But look what happened to him winding up on television. By the way, he had to file a report to his local field office about hearing, quote unquote, classified information that turns out to likely not be classified, but it winds up on Tom DeLong's Instagram account and on television. So he goes into that as well about having to file a report and, and having to make note of the fact that he shows up in uniform at what should have been a private meeting and cameras show up unbeknownst to him, but he had no knowledge of it until he wound up on television. So what do we do with all this? Is this guy telling the truth? Is he just an anonymous disgruntled? I didn't get my job. So I'm going to come out guns blazing more than two and a half years after it happened. I, I really don't know. All I can say is, is this is a small piece of the puzzle in a much bigger picture that this charade, whether or not it's orchestrated by former government employees, former DOD employees, former counterintelligence agents, the government itself, I'm, I'm not really sure. But whatever's being orchestrated here, it's not healthy. And it's cultivating a certain percentage of people, not the majority, but a certain percentage of people involved in this movement that's inching closer and closer to violent rhetoric. Now, that may seem like a left turn from what we've been talking about for the last hour or so, but I think that with this counterintelligence agent coming forward, it's showing us that the games are not just on UFO Twitter. They're not just on Facebook. They're not just in these small chat rooms. That whatever game it is, whomever side you choose, it doesn't matter to me. My point is the same. It's getting dangerous. Where former and or current military and civilian personnel within the Department of Defense and the Pentagon are essentially, we'll call it warring, that they are going like this towards each other, that they're angry, that they're speaking out against each other. This is going deeper and getting messier. And I'm seeing rhetoric change from voices that that I won't I won't name. I don't need to I don't need to make anybody look bad. But rather I hope that you all notice that minority of those that are out there that is slowly growing in numbers and volume and using phrasing like going to war and preparing for battle and that type of phrasing What's, what's sad is that you hear a lot about, like, let's say QAnon online and, and you see the January 6th, whatever you want to call it, insurrection, riot, whatever. And then you work backwards and you see the language that they were using going up to that. And you see a lot of the same types of phrases. 
And I hate to use that comparison, but this is the frightening part that if you remove QAnon and, and put ufology in there, we could potentially be getting into a dangerous area by yet again, a small but growing number of people. I've talked about the death threats that I've received doing the Black Vault and doing what I do, but that's just a small and, and to be honest with you, kind of irrelevant situation. The bigger picture is people are getting violent. And it's all stemming from these games of charades. These, these stories are infecting people to a point where you get, you get so involved in it. I've used the LARP terminology uh, to describe a lot of this, a live action role-playing game. You look around and this is what's going on. And you look at the types of comments from people just on social media and you see that although some people just get mad and they get angry and that that's fine. That's not what I'm referring to. But some people just get so worked up. They are getting borderline violent. And that's what's scary about this entire situation. We need to just take a step back. We need to deal with the facts. We need to deal with documents. We need to deal with uh, verifiable testimony. And we need to deal as much. We, we need to deal with as much as the of the evidence as we can. But instead, there's just faction that's growing that doesn't care about the full of the evidence, the totality of it all. They only care about the small portion that agrees with their already made up mind. And that's the problem with stories like this. I'm not here to tell you that this counterintelligence agent is 100% telling the truth and we should you know, dis disbelieve everyone else involved. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the waters are getting messier they're getting muddier. It's getting more worrisome because it, it, it really is creating an issue in the grander picture. And when I go back to that LARP, the live action role-playing game, you look around, you look at some of these people, these factions that have formed these teams and you have the villains and you have the heroes and you have the warriors and you have all these different groups that are playing the game. And this is where it's getting dangerous. Whether or not you believe this CI agent or not, for him to have to go and create the case at his work because he's allegedly hearing potentially classified information and then it winds up in a TV show or on a rock star's Instagram. So that has to, uh, again, force him into doing that. I don't have any reason to disprove that at, at, at this point or disbelieve it. And I have no way to disprove it or even prove it. But let's just operate off the assumption for a moment that it's real. That's what we've gotten to. That people within the United States government and those that used to be within the United States government are creating these types of scenarios with games of charades. Again, it doesn't matter which one is right or which one is wrong. You can't look at this and say one of them is not playing a game of charades, creating these storylines and these false narratives, whether it be through an anonymous person, a named person on Reddit, on Twitter, it does not matter. But this is getting dangerous. The rhetoric is changing. The rhetoric is getting stronger. So I go back to that, you know, warring phraseology that people are using preparing for battle. This isn't battle. This is a conversation. This isn't something that we need to take up arms over. This is something we need to discuss. This is not something that we have to prepare for battle on. This is just something that we need to enlist the help of those smart minds that need to be involved in the conversation. Some people ask why I get passionate, like who cares about this? Well, we need to look at the totality of the evidence, all of it. We need to separate the wheat from the chaff. We need to figure out who's telling the truth and who's not. Because the moment you omit the information that may or may not challenge your beliefs, you're skewing it to a biased mindset. Your mind's already made up. So if you don't want to hear what may ultimately be BS, but it scares you to the point of sending people nasty messages and how dare you and you try and attack people's credibility. And uh, I've had people go after me on a personal level. Uh, against my business that has nothing to do with the Black Vault, UFOs, UAPs, the government FOIA, nothing. People pulling up uh, public information, but trying to dox me. Thankfully, my, my address is public, but their intent was malicious. 
that's wrong. We're in a stage here that this whole game needs to take a step back. And even though I don't single-handedly aim to change it, I believe that more people should learn to speak out and speak up. Like I've said a thousand times in this video, I don't blame Luis Elizondo or Tom DeLonge. In fact, if I had to bet money, I would almost guarantee that they just were not even aware that, that the secret filming was going on. But those are the types of voices that need to speak up. The silence doesn't help, in, in my opinion, because this goes well beyond a TV show. This goes well beyond Twitter. This goes well beyond all of us. This is something much bigger. But until we learn to deal with each other and then until we learn to, to understand the importance of actual evidence and, and being able to listen to one another, this conversation isn't going to go anywhere. It doesn't matter if there's a Gillibrand Amendment, congre congressional mandates, legislation, another Luis Elizondo come out. It doesn't matter. None of that will be relevant. If the people can't deal with each other, then all of this is kind of pointless. So I go back to dealing with all of the evidence. And I think as a closing here, I just want to say that that's what we have to do. We have to not be afraid to challenge our beliefs and challenge our mindset. And once we're comfortable doing that, it doesn't matter what evidence comes our way. We can deal with it, dissect it, vet it, take it for what it's worth. If it's something worth saving, great. If not, toss it and move on. But the, um, the reaction that I've seen to this story in the last two days has been incredibly telling. And it goes to why I say when I created this video, how I just don't want to do them anymore. Because why? To what extent? I would have 300,000 times the followers and make 100,000 times the ad revenue, which isn't a lot, let me tell you. But I would multiply it 100,000 fold if I just told you guys what you wanted to hear, if I just stopped trying to dissect information, show you the evidence, figure out what's real, try and separate the wheat from the chaff, if I waved goodbye to all of that and just dealt with what you guys wanted to hear, I could retire, I bet. But sadly, that's not who I am or who we should be. And the last 48 hours have really showed me that on social media to where they don't want, some people don't want to be lied to. They want to chastise the government for lying. And yet I show them a video where Tom DeLong, who's been preaching so many things in the last few years, admits to fabricating stories. And those same voices cheer him on and say, all right, yeah, that's what we need to do. Wait, what? None of that makes sense. So I hope that that makes sense to you. And I hope it shows you why I do what I do. And even though I feel that this may be my last ATIP slash OSAP related video until something new comes out, I'm sure something new will come out soon and we'll have to do it all over again. So I'm not going anywhere. But I can tell you that frustration is incredibly, incredibly hard to deal with in situations like this. We should be having a conversation, but instead people have created these factions these warring factions, and that is more damaging than debunking or skepticism or anything else. We should deal with all the evidence. We should deal with all the facts. We should sit down, learn to discuss, and go from there. At least that's what I want this channel to be about. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, a huge help to this channel is hitting that thumbs up button. If you can also make sure you're subscribed, and if you want to make sure that you're notified when I go live, Make sure you turn the notifications on as well. If you're listening via the podcast audio version, the blackvault.com slash live will bounce you to the video channel. That way you can see all the videos. And of course, a review is always helpful on those podcast platforms. I aim for five stars, but more than that, I aim for your honesty. So however you feel you want to rate it, that is fine with me. Thank you guys again for listening and tuning in. I appreciate you sticking with me on these deep dives. Until next time, this is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.